I wanna start with a question. When is the last time that you were persecuted because of your belief in Christ? Or maybe lost a job because you were reading your Bible during lunchtime or maybe praying? I think for us in America, we don't deal with the type of persecution that majority of the world deals with in their pursuit of Christ. And so we've been working through the book of 1 Peter for almost three months now. And in this series, we've seen over and over and over again how Peter keeps coming back to this idea of suffering and and this living hope within it. And just for a little bit of context is that Peter is writing to a group of Christians living in the Roman provinces, provinces, and they're under immense persecution because of their faith. And instead of like going into a story, I just feel like today, I just really want to get into the text. So if your Bible's with you, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4 from verse 12 to 19. And this is what it says. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. For if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and of the sinner? And lastly, verse 19, Peter says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now, there's three things here I kind of want to lean into in terms of suffering. Now, We've talked about suffering multiple times. And, and, and if you're taking notes, um, suffering is brought up 21 different times in this five chapter letter that, that Peter writes. And so this is definitely something that he's really trying to get them to, to realize is suffering with a living hope. And so there's three things that I think kind of will help us understand not just where they're at, but also how we can Uh, pursue Christ in the midst of our world as well. So the first thing I see is don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. In verse 12, uh, Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when, when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And the first thing I wanna kind of draw our attention to is the first word, beloved. What a beautiful word that Peter uses here. He says, beloved. It's like, he, he's, he's saying like, I understand where you're at. I see you, I love you. It's like a pastor pouring out his heart to his congregation and saying, I understand what you're dealing with. You are beloved, you are cared for and deeply loved. And then he uses a unique phrase. He says, a fiery trial. Now, just a little bit of history lesson Um, in about most scholars and theologians believe that that Peter started writing this letter uh, around 62, 63 AD. And at the summer of 64 AD, there was a massive fire that took place in Rome. And because of this fire was taking place, uh, the Roman citizens were scared. Uh, their houses were being burned. Their business were being taken away. Um, and, and just this massive fire was happening. And so the Romans started to blame Nero, the emperor, because what Nero had done is he started putting his soldiers around the fire to protect the fire from going out, which is so strange. But but Nero was trying to build this city into his image is what he would say, this beautiful city. And so as this revolt was happening, Nero started to blame the Christians. 
and say, you know, those Christians, the ones that you do not like, that don't like you. And, and so like they're trying to burn down our beautiful city. And to stake his claim even more is that he would gather up Christians, hoist them on poles, put tar on their bodies and set them on fire to be torches for their city. And, and Peter uses this phrase, a fiery trial, and, and it's something that these citizens would understand exactly what's going on, this fiery trial that they're experiencing because of their faith. So moving on, it, it says, you see, it's not so surprising for Peter to bring this up. And he says, do not be surprised as though something strange were happening to you. I think this is interesting. For a lot of us, like we are surprised when things happen to us, right? Um, we, it, we are surprised, but, but if we have a relationship with the Lord, it should come to be an expectation that things will happen to us, that people aren't gonna be happy about us. But so many times when things do happen, when suffering does take place, when there's trials and tribulation and hurt and pain, we ask a question often, why? Why does this have to happen to me? Or um, maybe at one time you're connecting well with a group of people and you're like, why does it feel like I'm all alone? Why, why am I not connecting with people that I used to connect with? Or, or we say, this isn't fair. I should have got that job promotion instead of that person. And so we, we kind of go back and forth between this why or it's just not fair. And we're almost like shocked or surprised. It doesn't fall in our favor. And if our life is right with Christ, we should expect a little bit of tribulation. But too many of us, we kind of lean toward the why or this isn't fair. Now, if you look here, Peter then says, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now, so for us, we think that we should experience maybe not as many trials. It's almost like, you know, God, it's like this transaction that happens. You know, I place my hope and trust in you, so you should bless me with, you know, things that I would like. And so we have this kind of Old Testament, like ideology in our brain, where when things are going well, when I'm blessed, like I see the outcomes of it and, and I must have sinned or something must have happened is why things aren't happening in my favor. Or sometimes we think that maybe, we, maybe it's okay to experience some trials and tribulations, suffering, persecution, but, but maybe not as many that we should have more happy moments than struggles. But, but Peter says this, that you will share in Christ's suffering. When we look to Jesus in his life, when people were reviling against him, saying bad things, he didn't return those words back. When he was spat at, when evil was done to him, he didn't do those things in return. He led with love. And when we're in this place, and especially even uh, uh, these, these Christians living in, in, in this Roman province, is when they're under this immense persecution, instead of fighting back and trying to even the score, be like Christ, share in his suffering, and lead with love. You and I, that should be something that people know and recognize about us, is how we lead with love again and again and again. And when we do this, we learn how to become more like Christ in the midst of anguish, in the midst of grief, and when things are unfair. Moving on, it, it says that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. It's like, this is the blessing. This is a blessing. When we rejoice while suffering, it shows where our hope is at, that God sees me, that he will be with me. That through the ups and downs of life, when things at this point that Peter's writing to, when it's clearly on the down, that he's with us, watching over and connecting with us. I, I love this. It says, first comes suffering, then comes glory. First comes suffering, then comes glory. Being confident in our hope that it will happen, that there's this greater purpose in mind. 
when we're walking in the ways and becoming more like Christ and less like ourselves? What if though we looked at trials a little bit differently than what we tend to do? Again, our tendency is to ask why. Why is this happening? Or it's unfair or, or you fill in the blank. But what if we look at it a little bit differently? What if instead of asking the why question, we really ask the, God, what are you trying to teach me now? What is something that I need to surrender over to you? How can I be like you in the world around me? What if we start looking at things a little bit different from a different perspective of this is unfair, I'm shocked that this is happening to what do you want me to do with what's going on? God, I trust in you more than myself. Now, the second thing that I see in uh, um, this, in, the, in, in light and lieu of all this persecution that Peter brings up is blessed suffering. This idea of blessed suffering. Uh, uh, it says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Now, really quick, there's multiple ways that suffering happens. And Peter only talks about two ways that in, in this to the people he's writing to that they're experiencing suffering. And, and again, there's multiple avenues, but we're only gonna kind of stay in this road of the two things that he talks about where suffering takes place. The first is when we identify with who Jesus is. That's the first type of suffering. And then he also talks about a suffering of our choices. And so we're gonna kind of stay in this lane of where suffering is found. So the first thing he says, if if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Suffering in the name of Jesus, as, as crazy as it sounds, is a blessing. Now, again, for us, when we think of blessings, we, we can think of material things, or we can think of maybe a job promotion, financial gain, maybe uh, with our family and different things like that, which is very similar to uh, uh, even what the people that Peter is writing to, that their idea of a blessing are these like material types of things. And when you're not uh, being blessed or, or whatever, it's like you, you must have sin in your life, which is very similar to even us as well, where I didn't get that job promotions because I was doing this and, and God's you know, punishing me for it. And so we have this weird tendency to think as that as well. But what Peter is saying is that suffering in the name of Jesus is a blessing. If we are following Jesus, there will be suffering. I love this when uh, in, in verse 14, he goes on, it says, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. It's not that uh, the Holy Spirit is just kind of hovering over and just watching you uh, suffer and uh, be like, you know, I'll just give it another try. Like, <laughs> that's not what the Holy Spirit is doing. He is with you in the midst of it. That he's connected with you much deeper, that he's in your corner. He hasn't abandoned you and that he's with you in the battle. You see, when suffering happens, we get to be with Jesus. We get to be with them. I would rather be with Jesus in the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trials, instead of not being with him. And there's too many of us. And, and the reality is, is we all suffer, whether you follow Christ or not, there's suffering that happens. And for me, I would rather suffer with Christ than without him. Too many of us try to even the score, even, even with suffer. sorry. Too many of us try to even the score. And Peter warns against this in his letter. He says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. He, he's saying, don't match what's happening to you. Remember, lead with love. Don't create your own suffering. 
Don't create your own, you're already suffering. Don't create more problems for you. And it's understandable to even the score. In, in this day and age that Peter's writing to, it's understandable that they want to fight back. It's understandable that they want to take the, you know, take over and say, this isn't right. It's understandable clearly, but lead with love again and again and again. The reality is in this, historically speaking, Rome eventually fell. Christianity continued to rise because they led with love again and again and again. Um, a revolt didn't change Rome, love did. And when we suffer as a Christian, he says, let him not be ashamed. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Peter again is reiterating, when we suffer, we are connected deeper with Jesus, that we have a better understanding of who he is when we suffer with Christ. I believe that too many of us, that when we have a bit of suffering that comes our way, again, um, maybe we, we feel like we're not as connected with people. We feel that, um, you know, some things are happening to us that is unright or unjust. And we have a tendency to become timid with our faith. We have a tendency to kind of, kind of hold back and try and hope and pray that the storm blows over. But in doing this, we, we miss out on an opportunity. And that opportunity is to show people who Jesus is in our life. We miss out on an opportunity to show people where our hope comes from when we kind of wait back and wait for the storm to pass by. In the midst of trials, in the midst of pains, in the midst of suffering, it's important to show people where our joy comes from. And I feel most importantly, a blessing we miss out on is joining with Jesus. One of my favorite memories when I was uh, a young kid with my father was when I was in fourth grade. Um, it was November in fourth grade, my fourth grade year. And my dad woke me up early in the morning and he's like, hey son, you wanna go hunting with me? And I was like, dad, I can't. You know, it's like, it's like Monday or Tuesday. I was like, I have school today. I can't go. And he's like, no, I'll call you in. Now for a kid, that's like the greatest thing in the world. You don't have to go to school. You get to hang out with your dad. You know, it's just this kind of fun time. And full disclosure, that was the first time I've ever been hunting. And it's also been the last time I've ever been hunting. Hunting and, and me don't really kind of mix very well. But what I love about that day is that I got to spend the day with my father. I got to join him in what he was doing. And he got to experience my aggravation hunting as well, where I had to be quiet and I couldn't move too much. And I had to carry some things, but, but just being with my father. You see, when, when we uh, join Christ in this type of suffering, we get to be with him in the midst of good, as well as in this case, in the midst of bad. And we miss out on this blessing of being with Jesus. So the question I have for you is, are you willing to suffer with Jesus or are you too consumed with your own suffering, with your own mess that you've created? The last thing I wanna kind of draw our attention to is entrust your souls, is to entrust your souls. In verse 17, it says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Last verse, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now, real quick, verse 17 is a bit confusing. And uh, I spent a lot of time looking at different commentators, uh, looking at people that, uh, that I respect, that, that kind of dissect the Bible. And, and so I kind of landed, I, I, not kind of, I landed on what I believe verse 17 is saying. And it's really important to look at the context 
of who Peter is writing to and what they are experiencing again, which is suffering. And this is where, uh, what's in verse 17. It says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Now, here's the thing. This is kind of what I have, is that we think judgment as a negative thing. Like when we're being judged, it's like this bad thing that's happening. But judgment has already begun. For us who follow Christ, we're being judged right now on this side of heaven by the people around us. And, and who Peter is talking to, you they are being judged because the people around them now, here's the thing. When you're judged on this side of heaven with the relationship with the Lord as a Christian, you're being judged now. So it's better for that to happen now than later eternally without him. And so this is what Peter's saying. It's proof of our allegiance to Jesus. And we will suffer at some point, either in this temporary life or what is to come. And then he goes on and he says, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? It's almost like this is a lesser, greater argument that he's doing here. Peter is saying it's hard here for a little while. It's ridiculously hard here. Granted, yes, totally. But what is to come will be much better. If you're following Jesus, he's always with you now and forever. The pain that you're experiencing now is with Jesus. And later on, once you pass, once you get to heaven, is you'll be with him there as well. Now, for those who are choosing sin and a life that doesn't show who Christ is, they may not be judged by the people around them currently, but there is a judgment that's coming. In verse 18, this is Peter, he's quoting Proverbs 11. He says, and if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? And so he's just really kind of supporting more of his case. And he's not saying you're barely saved, but because you're enduring hardship now, how much worse is it for the ungodly and the sinners? And in verse 19, he begins with, therefore. So therefore is this, in lieu of everything we've talked about, you know, with, with this uh, uh, greater, lesser argument that's taking place, in lieu of that, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Peter again is making this claim, suffering according to God's will. Not all suffering is the will of God. Some of it is our choices, and sometimes it's the choices that were made for us. But he says something that I think is very vital. He says, entrust. He says, entrust. When we entrust ourselves to, to someone, we're putting our hope in that. We're putting our hope and in, in our security in that. And what Peter is saying, he says, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust in him. It's, it's knowing you will be cared for. And Jesus did the same thing. Um, Peter uh, mentions in chapter 2, verse 23, that, that Jesus entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And if we are Christians, which means that we follow in his example, we should also entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly. Peter is saying those who suffer will, um, or excuse me, Peter is saying those who suffer with God can know they are cared for. So question for you, do you have enough trust in God to trust him with your soul? Do, do you have enough trust in him to trust him with your soul? Do you, uh, uh, to know that he has your best intentions in mind, that it may not feel like you're being protected, but he's with you in the midst of it all. And he's gonna be with you now as well as what is to come. And lastly, Peter says to a faithful creator, a faithful creator, a faithful God who's with you, who keeps his promises, 
that's with you and loves you so much so that he sent his son to die on a cross for you, that he's with you all the way through. And lastly, while doing good. You see, our job and our calling is to trust God with actions. It's to trust him with actions. We're called to do good in Jesus's name for his glory and not ours. And instead of like holding back and waiting for the storm to pass, instead of doing those types of things and, and sitting and just waiting for his return, we need to be loving with actions, to stand strong with him, to trust that it may be hard, it may be rough now, but there's hope that's coming. This was a hard message. It was a very heavy message, but I hope that you hear what suffering with Christ looks like. Have a great week. I'm going to pass it off to the campus pastors and we'll see you guys soon. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us just for an extra couple minutes. Um, I want to land in a missional moment. Typically we do transformational moment, but I think with this message, it really kind of leans to praying for people that are in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trials. And so the missional moment I have is pray for a persecuted Christian. And uh, this is a resource for you to go to, to kind of find out like people, people groups, um, you know, uh, organizations to pray for that are in a place where they are being persecuted, where there is suffering that's taken place. I mean, we can definitely pray for America because things like that, we need to pray for our country, but there are definitely people in places where it's persecuted, where they experience a type of suffering that these first, uh, first century Christians were experiencing. And so let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for your grace and thank you for your love. Thank you that we can live in a country where we don't experience these types of sufferings and these types of persecutions that most of the world does experience. But God, I pray right now for uh, these Christians that are being persecuted that you'll watch over them, that you'll protect them, that you'll guide them, that you'll give them favor in where they're at. God, help us to be the type of people that pray for people, but also to be willing to, to stand in the gap and love people well, to, to show who you are with not just words, but with actions. Help us to always lead with love. Thank you again for you and your goodness. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Guys, have a great week and we'll see you soon.